Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be with you here at the Investing in Africa Conference and Expo. This morning, I'll be speaking on the topic of rural economies and the paralyzing culture of underinvestments. My name is Peter Williams. I'm president of the International Institute of Rural Reconstruction. And today I'll be speaking from perspective of a human focused, community focused, international non-governmental organization. Throughout this talk, I'll be framing my statement across a number of sections. The organization that I represent has been around for the past 60 years and we've been working in Africa for the last 30 years. To begin with, Africa has the fastest growing population in the world, certainly in the 20th century. Projected to reach 2.5 billion people by 2050, a majority of African population will remain rural until the 2040s, notwithstanding expanding urbanization. Rural economies in Africa account for a significant share of employment and output, but they are also characterized by work deficits and poverty. You see, rural economies host nearly 80% of the world's poor, and in Africa, over 60% of rural dwellers live in extreme poverty. Two thirds of the continent's population live and work in rural areas and agriculture represents 65%. So two thirds of all jobs in Sub-Saharan Africa. Eradicating poverty in Africa and in fact around the globe will not be possible unless we prioritize rural economies. While these barriers to, the, to this goal or rather while the barriers to this goal are substantial, there is significant potential on the continent and across the continent for creating productive jobs and contributing to sustainable development and economic growth by increasing investment and investing more strategically in Africa. So what's the state of investment in rural economies today? And what are the human costs of underinvestment? Well, the lack of investment in rural Africa is most apparent and often highlighted through agricultural outputs. Per capita food production has barely grown over the last 50 years, and agriculture only represents 17% of sub-Saharan GDP. The continent's productivity continues to decline from this low starting point. This has resulted in decreasing food security because of current low cereal yields. These are the lowest in the world. Africa is in a food deficit. The region spent more than $30 billion to import basic grains in 2011, according to the Food and Agricultural Organization. Today, for every $1 it earns in agricultural exports, mainly coffee, cotton, cocoa, the region spends nearly $2 on agricultural imports, mainly food. There are numerous knock-on effects caused by this underdevelopment of the rural economy. There's a lack of decent work and consequently extremely low income, low educational attainment, decreasing health, and limited to no access to credit. African countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, continuously score extremely low on the Human Development Index. Faced with dismal work prospects and a declining quality of life, many people are forced to leave their homes and flee to urban centers, which are struggling to cope with the burden of an exponentially growing population and continuously increasing labor pool. This trend is set to expand quite rapidly, actually, in the coming decades as climate change worsens agricultural conditions in rural areas even more. So you will ask what challenges and what possibilities for improvement exists? Well, the two most widely recognized challenges to rural African development are low agricultural productivity and poor and absent infrastructure, which are very much intertwined with each other. Allow me to provide an overview of each. First, agriculture. 
Well, what we know is that agriculture accounts for one third of the continent's GDP and two thirds of its citizens rely on the sector for their incomes. As I outlined previously, there are very low levels of land and labor productivity across much of the continent and any increases in productivity have, small, have been small and slow. The size of economic growth is not the only indicator of success though. Even when growth occurs, this optimistic news is often tempered by the observation that rural economies are not the only, I'm sorry, are not transforming towards more productive and sustainable business. The growth that we've seen has largely been in primary production, buoyed in the latter half of the 2000s by higher commodity prices. However, because changes to the structure of economies have been small, the development of manufacturing and high value services has been correspondingly weak. Moreover, productivity increases have been limited in primary sectors and low value services. Overall, productivity, whether of land or labor, has grown only modestly since the early 1990s. So where do these obstacles to productivity lie? One, returns to more product productive technologies on farms are lower than expected. Two, the risks of adoption are too high. Three, markets for inputs, credit, and insurance work imperfectly. Four, there's insecure rights over land that deter investments. And five, technical knowledge is not getting to farmers. All of these five factors can be attributed in part to the second challenge, infrastructure. The continent and especially its rural areas face extremely high access costs to all infrastructure subsections. And the crucial area of energy has the largest deficit at present. Although total road density and access to clean water compare relatively well, they still lag behind other global developing regions. In the area of information and communication technology, ICT, even the top five African countries are only ranked 66th and 109th on a global index. Some reports suggest that annual infrastructure investments needs in Africa total approximately $93 billion. That's one third of which is needed to cover operations and maintenance. This is more than double the current spending of $45 billion a year. Two less commonly discussed challenges must also be mentioned in order to place this all within a context. First, there are various institutional problems that hamper what investments are dedicated to rural economies. Low institutional capacity and high institutional inefficiencies hamper investments' productive potential. Spending on infrastructure and agriculture is in broad strokes, inefficient and insufficiently regulated, and also uncoordinated regionally. Secondly, there's a stigma surrounding investments in areas of rural agriculture, I'm sorry, in rural Africa, that must be combated. The massive productive potential of rural communities has been undervalued by governments, international development leaders, investors, and policymakers alike. The continent accounts for 60% of the world's arable land and most of its countries do not achieve 25% of their potential yield. Take for example, between the years 2006 and 2011, Africa had, its, had the highest rates of returns on inflows of foreign direct investments, 11.5% compared to a global average of 7.1%. Half the world's 12 fastest growing countries are in Africa. There is a growing youthful population. We must recognize that investment can empower rural communities, which also, while also generating high returns. Now, on the attitudes of how we can emerge victorious from the current paralyzing culture of this underinvestment in rural 
uh, African uh, companies may broadly be categorized into three camps. And I want to summarize that briefly. The first is one that's championed by the researcher and scholar Paul Collier and many other notable economists, holding that large scale investments often involving transnational purchases of land to create jobs and bring technology to the sector. The second proposal advocates for supporting smallholder farms and points out the risks of cross-border land acquisition or so-called land grabs, among other forms of foreign direct investment. In particular, this camp emphasizes risk to local rights, the risk of extracting short-term profits at the cost of long-term sustainability, the broader social good and corruption. A third way, perhaps a middle way, proposes a contractual relationship between large buyers who enter into agreements with smallholder farmers to deliver products. Regardless of the strategy that you subscribe to when considering how to achieve the largest impact from your investment, there are some universally applicable suggestions that I would like to suggest investors keep in mind. First, we need to think in terms of ESG, environmental, social governance. In this context, I mean that we need to encourage investments with a macro long-term perspective. Investment that, investment that recognizes not only what has been the most productive potential right now, but forms of investment that will contribute to the creation of a better investment environment. This means social infrastructure, like health, education, skills development, entrepreneurship support, like cooperatives, innovative financial mechanisms. By investing in the core resource of humans, the groundwork is laid for lower risk, more efficient investments in the future. Social protection and basic rights must be prioritized. Next, investment must be climate friendly. For the continent to move forward strategically, Africa's land and natural resources must be managed sustainably and climate action should be used to build resilience against the impact of climate change. Investors can support this goal by, for example, adopting a food systems approach to their investments in agriculture, allowing for the simultaneous target, targeting of economic, environmental, and social sustainability. We must also ensure that agricultural transformations and other goals and projects driven through investment are pursued sustainably. In this context, I'm referring to the sustainability of economic growth pursued on a continent with massive heterogeneity in social, political, economic, and environmental contexts. New initiatives should be co-designed with local actors, prioritize building local capacity, and be committed to creating an enabling economic and institutional environment for the sector. Next, even through rural economies, I'm sorry, next, even though rural economies are agricultural heavy, investment should not be restricted to the sector. Promoting rural areas also means combining agriculture with industrial and service activities to stimulate synergies and diversification and to seize new opportunities in ICT, tourism, biotechnologies, environmental protection, and renewable energy generation, among others. Inadequate infrastructure, rural communications, irrigation, rehabilitation, and modernization. Finally, investors should be working in collaboration with various stakeholders. An ideal investment approach will be integrated and promote linkages with public stakeholders, rural workers, and entrepreneurial structures, and also encourage dialogue with youth and women in particular. An efficient private sector will only be possible if investments by entrepreneurs match the location and timing 
of government investments in roads, markets, and other facilitating infrastructure. You see, if this can be achieved, investments in rural economies in Africa can move towards an increasingly high return endeavor as investments continue to release the potential of these areas by opening up new markets in farm and non-farm sectors. In conclusion, while we all agree that there is insufficient, even paralyzingly low levels of investment, simply investing more is not the answer. The specific localized needs of rural communities must be prioritized. Projects must be climate friendly and sustainable. And investments must be well matched to the capacities of communities as they, as they stand, if they will have a chance, or I should say, if they will have the chance of succeeding. This is a massive challenge, but the stakes and the potential rewards promise that this task is worth it. Increasing investments in rural economies is a necessary building block towards a continent with jobs, wealth, inclusion, food security, crisis resilience, and social and political peace. It is what NGOs like IIRR have been working towards for decades. Rural people, communities, and economies need be centered in national and international investment and development agendas. And I'm heartened that I've been allowed to do so here today. Thank you very much.